Good morning guys, good morning internet. Hi, my name is EJ. Uh, welcome back to my channel and I do art narrated time-lapse videos or narrated art time-lapse videos. Uh, I basically just talk about my art process and whatnot. So yeah, yay, <laughs> welcome back. Anyways, um, I have a lot of stuff that I want to cover, uh, but before I go over that, um, I want to talk about what's going on in the screen first of all so do hang on um and keep watching in the video because i do have some announcements that i want to go over um but again like i said i'll pause on those announcements and talk about it later and just talk about what's going on in blender because we are currently in blender right now so yeah um the video initially started with me doing a few sketches and then it cut off real quick because I didn't, <laughs> I think I only recorded it for 15 minutes before deciding that I was going to do Blender. And so here I am with Blender and, um, I'll just talk about real quick what I'm doing with Blender and then I'll talk about my reasoning later on. Um, in Blender right now, I'm setting up a character that was created with the MB lab plugin, such an awesome plugin. If you want, uh, just a quick human anatomy reference, that's what I mainly use this tool for. Um, I don't directly copy uh, the character. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. In this case, it, the, char the, the character I ended up doing became a conglomeration and mix a mashup, mix up of this character and another photo that I was using, which is a photo of Bridget Mendler, actually, uh, the actress. Um, so yeah, so I set up this character mainly for lighting and anatomy reference. This is the main reason why I'm setting this scene up. So you could tell that I uh, recreated the scene as quickly as much as I can. I just threw in a few walls with a few windows and a few lighting schemes and rendered that basically just so that I could have a lighting reference that I will eventually end up using throughout the creation of this illustration um and then after i was done with that i am now back doing dress sketches this is what you're um seeing and watching right now in the video is just me doing this studies on the maria clara gown i'll talk more about the maria clara gown later um but it's a very specific outfit to the filipino tradition um it's a traditional filipino costume basically <laughs> it's what it is not costume but outfit because it's more of an outfit than a costume but yeah uh so i'm trying to do a traditional maria clara dress sketches just drawing a bunch of them but then i ended up doing lace sketches uh which is good because the maria clara gown is actually heavy on lace um which again i'll talk more in that later um but you see eventually that all my studies ended up becoming studies on the maria clara or on lace not maria clara but on the lace um and so yeah uh, those were the studies i have after i did those studies um i would reference those sketches back and forth every now and then um they're displayed on the other screen that's why you'll never ever see it in the main screen that we're watching right now but yeah every now and then um i'll pull it up and look at it you know while i'm doing the main sketch for this main illustration now <laughs> to talk about what is going on in krita you are probably like wait there's something already there how come you didn't start from scratch and <laughs> The reason why is because this illustration technically started out based on a Bridget Mendler promotional photo from way back in like, I don't know, 2010, 2012, I think. And then I started this illustration maybe like 2014, 2015. I don't even remember. It was like a while back. So it's such a long time ago. Um, point of the matter is... Um, is that I saw this photo of Bridget Mendler and I thought that I could create something out of it that's kind of like fantasy theme in my head, which is basically what ended up in the illustration, you know? There's this sort of magical baby that in the title of the piece I started calling the royal baby, you know, I figured well, might as well make him royalty or something, you know? 
Um, but he also has like magical powers because um, as you can see in the final illustration, he has glowing tattoos, you know. Um, so it's kind of like a magical royal baby that this handmaiden is um, taking care of or caring. Um, so yeah. Um, but basically that's you know what the photo was it's not his photo i want to repurpose it something to that effect and since this was done like way back in 2014 i wasn't doing any kind of screen recording yet of any of my artwork so that's the reason why you know when i started artwork i probably put in just like two hours to so like five hours of work and then i ended up kind of getting distracted by something else and so i dropped this piece of work and then i decided to pick it up again sometime in 2018 um and so basically when I picked it up, that's where I left off, where I did this quick sketch of Bridget Mendler based on the photo and did a quick um, coloring in of the sketch and then left it there. And then I just basically pick it up. And then I realized, you know what, in order for me to like fully detail this the way I want to detail this and the way I want to develop it. Um, I needed a lot more references. So that's the reason why I did the dress sketches and that's why I did the blender render, um, which you saw earlier on. You saw snippets of it uh, early on um, because I was going to continuously refer to it, basically. And now that I have all of this information, Maria Clara addresses and the blender, uh, I probably have it off to the side in my other screen, uh, which you can't see right now. Um, I started doing a good line sketch. <laughs> so um, I kept the original sketch of Bridget Mendler, which you see her right there. Um, that's the original sketch that I got from the photo. Um, in the original photo, she was wearing just, you know, uh, a shirt. <laughs> it's not a shirt. It's not a t-shirt, obviously. What is a uh, crop? the tank top she's wearing a tank top i was trying to remember what the outfit is called she was wearing a tank top and jeans was what she was wearing oh no wait khaki pants was what she was wearing khaki pants and the tank top was what she was wearing in in the original photo and she's uh carrying a baby which is you see her in <laughs> which we see in my illustration um and then obviously in my re-sketch um I, I gave her a dress instead of giving her the outfit that she had. So, yeah, da, da, da. but I kept that original sketch and then I started um, doing the sketch on top of it. Now, this sketch was based off a photo bash session that I did. Um, I, I did the photo bash session very, very quickly. Uh, you know, it was like an hour to two hours long when I did the photo bash session. <laughs> but in this video, it probably just went by two seconds. Because it happens so fast, so quick, I couldn't even <laughs> catch up with my explanation of it. But anyway, so the photo bash section went by real quick. And so my quick sketch was based off of that photo bash, right? So I did a quick sketch, and then after the quick sketch, I'm going back and doing a much more detailed line sketch. Um, Part of me felt like this line sketch was sort of unnecessary because a lot of the line sketch is going to go away anyways you know but part of me also wanted just a good line sketch man because seriously a good line sketch is really awesome so um i went ahead and just did it because i knew that i was going to be spending a lot of time on this piece anyway so might as well just add another few hours or two of the you know for the work just to have you know a good nice reference once it start the detailing process you know um the main thing in my head though is to not be married so much to the line sketch because it used to be when i was you know back in the day when i do a good line sketch i was always married to it like i was afraid to deviate from the good line sketch once i start doing my detailing my coloring phase you know and i used to hate not uh, changing the line sketch but nowadays since you know I've matured <laughs> um, I deviate a lot from my original line sketch you know which is fine you know because I think that's 
that kind of shows evolution of the piece anyways you know if the piece is turning out to be something else that you expected it to be you need to run away with that instead of just trying to hammer out your original idea because you'll be surprised as to where you end up if you just run away with a different path you know so i i definitely got used to not being married to a good line sketch although i love a good line sketch love love a good line sketch I'm not married to it anymore that once I start the painting process, if it changes, if something changes during the painting process, I just run away with it as much as I can. But in this case, I really just wanted a good reference for once the detailing part begins. Hence the reason why I decided to just go ahead and take the time to do the line sketch, which is what I'm doing right now. Um, now, after this good line sketch, I'm going to go over the dress real quick on the line sketch. Then after that, I will do a lot of light tweaks and a lot of, not light tweaks, but um, color tweaking and filter changes and curve changes. A lot of filter edits basically is going to happen after that. And then after that part, I'll end up smudging them all. And then after that, I presented it for critique. I got a few comments. I didn't. I did more filter edits after after I got those comments. And then after that, I pretty much start my detailing process. So that's pretty much what's gonna happen in the next few minutes. Um, whew, yeah, that was a lot of things going on the first ten minutes. Wow. Okay. Now that I could catch my breath, finally. We could start going over a few things. Um, the very first thing, I, do I want to do announcements first or do I want to talk about my ideas for this piece first? I can't, I can't decide. Let's go with announcements first. Okay, so in my channel, um, my channel is really divided between long work and speed work. Um, my speed paints are a consistent and constant updates to my channel. I will always post like at least two of them every month, the first and the fifteenth. Um, so those are fun. Um, those videos are edited way ahead of time, like sometimes months ahead of time. Um, so sometimes it gets really off <laughs> current events. I did this little. Uh, misprediction <laughs> I don't know if you guys have noticed but like two months ago I thought this whole COVID thing was gonna not drag on so I kind of you know did an early recording of a video thinking that the COVID thing was gonna be over but then I was like so wrong so I kind of wrote on a snippet of the video my apologies for it um so yeah, since I do all my recordings for all the speed paints, sometimes I, I get off track current events or I'm not in current events. And that's the reason why my long grinds, my long renders um, are kind of cool because the moment I finish it, I pretty much just, you know, try to publish it in a way and have a video of it. So this is, this is why this update is cool because this is pretty much close to real time as I could get, you know, I'll probably have this video a week to two weeks after I do a recording instead of months ahead of time. So I'm pretty much right on track of current events. So yeah, it's summer of June is <laughs> when I'm doing this recording. Um, it's summer of June. It's summer <laughs> in June is when I'm doing this vocal recording. So yeah. Um, but the thing that I really wanted to talk about is the next few set of videos that have set up and line up um, to be shown. Um, July's videos are pretty much already set and done and recorded. Um, they're very cool. Um, July 1's video is going to be a little tricky because I'm doing a master study. And in that mas master study, I'm doing a study on an adult cartoon artist. So the picture that I'm studying is pretty much rated PG. And so it's not like um, something that's rated R or anything. But uh, if you do have children like watching these, you know, as a supplemental education material, do watch out for the fact that uh, I'm doing a study 
an, an artist that might not be rated PG, but the photo that I'm studying is rated PG. But it's really cool. I really love that study, and I'll talk more about it in my July 1 video. July 15th video is going to be very, very cool. Um, it's not one of my favorite <laughs> illustrations slash speed paints, in all honesty, but it's like one of the more effective illustrations. And so and that's part of the reason why I decided to do a video on that. Uh, August's video is really, really creepy. It was unintended to be creepy. I don't know why it ended up creepy. But yeah, the subject matter is kind of creepy, <laughs> which is not really my forte. Um, so August is going to be interesting. Um, it's like an early Halloween or whatnot are <laughs> the two illustrations I'm going to be doing. And that's it. Those are so far the ones I've edited so far. Uh, I really wanted September's videos to be done by now, but I'm kind of behind in that goal, which is fine. You know, at least I'm, you know, a few videos ahead. So yeah, that's what's to look forward to in my channel if you happen to be one of my few subscribers. So cool times, man, cool times. Um, so yeah, those were really my quick announcements. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is the idea behind this illustration, which I've briefly talked about already. Um, the idea was to create like a fantasy based illustration. Uh, so yeah, there, there's really not that much in depth <laughs> more than that. I just basically saw a photo of Bridget Mendler and I thought I could respin it as something else. Um, the other thing that I really did want to talk about is the use of photos and photographs and references. In art, especially if you want to do realism, there's no way around it. You have to use references. You have to use references. You have to use references. And I get really criticized a lot for it. Um, my manager thinks I'm always copying when I'm really not. I'm actually just using references. Um, but yeah, when she says I'm copying, she just says it jokingly. I mean, she knows that I'm using it as references. Um, but it gets really, really tricky. And I'm always all about uh, giving credit to the original ones, you know. In this case, I really don't know who the original photographer or the photo that I use from. In fact, I don't really e even really know what the rights usage are for that photo. Um, I'm totally in the gray area for using that photo. Um, for me, I feel like I totally fall into the bracket of the Fair Use Act. Because if you look at my photo, it is fantasy based. It is totally different, totally different from the original photo. Um, so, you know, I can technically get away with this, um, but I would be very leery about selling this piece, for example, just because I, I can't track who the original photographer of that photo was. I think it was a promotional thing. Uh, by SaveTheChildren.org. I think that was the organization that took the photo of Bridget Mendler. Um, for all I know, it could be Bridget Mendler's, ugh, Bridget Mendler's photo too. Sorry, I mispronounced her name. Um, I don't really know. But either way, you know, to be safe on the safe side, I'm just, you know, doing an artwork based off of it without any kind of like monetary making process in my head because uh yeah i know i can't use a photo that way so yeah but um really what i really wanted to talk about is you, you as an artist if you're watching this uh, do be wary about that and do be aware of all the rights and issues and all that stuff that could happen in art creation process um in art there's really no way around using references you need to use references as much as you can it is the only way you will grow as an artist but do watch out for you know copyright issues that you might run into and whatnot um so yeah i guess that's all i really wanted to mention about that um but yeah um i also wanted to talk about the maria clara dress wow there's so much stuff to talk about <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I'm so chatty, but the Maria Clara dress is a traditional Filipino outfit. It is uh, an outfit that was very popular way back in the turn of the century, 1900. Um, I think it was very popular around Jose Rizal's time, 
around maybe 1890s, 1880s, 1890s, 1880s, something somewhere around that time. And it was pretty popular up until like the 1920s or something. But um, basically what the Maria Clara gown is, is um, it's a simple skirt and a simple shirt, tank top shirt. Um, but on top of that, they have like a lace cover, you know, like the skirt has a lace cover on top of it. And the tank top also has um, a shawl, I think is a, uh, is a great term for this piece of garment. Um, it has a lace shawl basically on top of it. And really it's a simple outfit. But the lace part is what is really intriguing about the Maria Clara gown slash dress because it gets very, very ornate and very unique. And so that's why the Maria Clara outfit, style of outfit, is very popular back in the day because it gets really beautiful, essentially. Um, so yeah, um lace sketch when you try and paint it it's a very very complicated thing and um that's something that i'm going to be talking about uh soon after the smudging process so yeah i'm in the smudging process now in the video and as soon as i'm done with the smudging process i'm going to start the detailing process and then i could talk some more about um how i did some of the effects in this painting
Okay, so at this point, I pretty much have started the detailing process. Um, one of the first things that, well, okay, before I started talking about that, I guess I can talk about what has transpired so far. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I after I did the whole smudging thing slash blending thing that I do to get to a base paint, basically the smudging process is just you know, for me to get to a base paint, like a base layer, then I'm going to put all my details upon or put my details on. Now, if uh, after I was done with that, I posted it for critiques. And one of the very critiques or one of the first critiques that I got was from Sticky from Sketch Zone. And he talked a lot about isolating the foreground from the background. Um, there was a lot of color issues that I was having and this typically happens after I'm done smudging because I put in so much color I just throw in a bunch of color and a bunch of random noise initially and I always do this I just go chaotic um, and there's kind of a logic to it it's really tricky working this way because sometimes when you put in chaos into your drawing it just ends up being chaos and really super busy that it gets hard to reclaim the harmony um but sometimes it's really easy to just doing a few filter edits and then boom you get harmony back um in my case you know i thought i pretty much got my harmony or like everything was kind of harmonized up until he started mentioning that the colors were too busy and too chaotic and so i did a lot of filter edits to get to this point and basically what i did was i desaturated the background a whole lot and really pump up the saturation on on Bridget Mendler well specifically her outfit just so that I could you know have her isolated from the background and it worked very well you know after I did the filter edits um, I think that she stands out especially since the background is super ornate and super detailed you know that that those details can get really busy too and can really distract from the foreground but i think i achieved like a nice balance overall with this piece um so yeah basically that's what happened you know with the critique um so i thought that was like one of the more helpful critiques that i got and there were a few other things that got mentioned like how there was the head was kind of off like the head size uh some felt like it was too big and i kind of thought it was too small you know but then i kind of did this whole compromise by just lengthening her skirt just to make it look like she's a lot taller so those were fixed and then after that i started doing uh the detailing process um Typically when I do my detailing process, well, okay, the detailing process is pretty much the same that I do all the time, which what I, I do is delineate my edges or make my edges a little sharper, uh, just so that shapes can be clearer. Uh, depending on what I'm working on, I don't necessarily do super sharp. Like if I'm working in the background, I don't need that as super sharp as the foreground, obviously, because the foreground is a focal point. Uh, so I delineate my edges, I accentuate the shadows, and I add highlights. On long grinds like these, and I love long grinds because um, they can be so zen when I'm working on it. Um, on long grinds like these, I go section by section. And I'm always conscious about over detailing because it is one of my weakest points when I first started doing these kind of illustrations. I have a bad tendency to over detail. Now I feel like I've gotten a nice little balance going on, you know. But that's still conscious in my po in my head when I'm working on pieces like this. You don't want to over detail too much. Um, so yeah. Um, but anyways, um, I just realized I started working on the details in the background um, when I was talking about over detailing. See, this part is really scary. What we're watching right now because. You know, I wanted the ornateness and the complicatedness of the background, but I also don't want the background to distract from the foreground. So again, like I said, be very wary about this because what could end up happening is that you could end up working a lot more than you need to. So it's always kind of like a nice balance to, to have when you're grinding in long pieces like this. You know, and the only way you can get a sense of the balance is if you keep doing these. So 
once you start on the long detailing process or start doing the long illustrations you know more than likely if you're a beginner artist you'll end up over detailing a lot at first until you get a sense of when to turn things down or when to turn when to tone it down in a way um it's still a long um i'm still a long way from achieving a nice balance in all honesty you know there's still times where i still end up over detailing but i think this piece is nicely balanced so you know some people might think it's too over detailed i don't know i didn't get that critique when i put it up for a final critique so i think it's a nice balance again i could be wrong <laughs> it's totally you know up to the person who's looking anyways um <laughs> enough about over detail i guess let me talk about the lace part um I knew when I was doing this illustration there was going to be a few effects that was going to be very very tricky which is the lace which I've worked on already and tattoo glowing tattoos and the floor the floor is so tricky so so tricky and yeah way over detailed I personally feel like like I feel like it went too a little photorealistic in the final illustration. Um, so yeah, <laughs> but anyways, let me talk about those special effects. Um, for the lace, what I did was that I, I did a few mo a few layers on it. Um, I basically did a hazy kind of um, whitish grayish. Uh, shading as like my bottom layer um so that it looks like there's kind of a dress there you know lace is so hard lace is so difficult um because they're so thin and see-through you know it's like painting glass is very very difficult you kind of have to do all this multiple layers of um uh, drawing so in my case like the very first layer like the very bottom layer is that gray and whitish value range that i drew in but then i set it like a 50 percent opacity or 70 percent opacity it, it's toned down really low or turned down really low for opacity and then on top of that i did like a generic um sketch of of the lace patterns um, and then I added another layer for highlights. So, and I basically just balanced those three main layers. I might have an extra one or two layer, uh, on that lace, uh, special effects. I don't remember, but I basically have three main layers, which is the base, uh, value range, and then a line sketch of, of the lace patterns. And the lace stitch stitchings and then highlights on top of that and they're all like a different opacity to just give off the look um sky from uh, another discord channel that i was in commented on how she wanted um the actual crisscross of of lace i mean if you look at lace outfits you know you, you could kind of see that um there's a crisscross pattern to it, you know. Um, but the thing with Maria Clara gown is that the crisscross is so small that you couldn't really see it. It's almost like pantyhose, for example. Like pantyhose is just the crisscross on it is just so small that you can't really see it um, from afar. So I tried doing. Uh, actually, no, I didn't even try doing the crisscross. Um, pattern like i decided to just skip that um but what i did to kind of you know solidify the idea that there was a, a lace gown lace covering to the skirt for example um sky also mentioned that um when you have like a lace fabric on top of another fabric um, it has a tendency to desaturate what's underneath it and that was such a good point of hers that i was like dude i have to employ that so like right now if you look at the lower right screen um if you look at bridget mendler's skirt it's, it's still saturated 
because the whole time that I was uh, working, you know, I didn't even really think about that. You know, I didn't really employ the whole desaturation of what's underneath until like much, much later. So I did employ that to kind of solidify the idea that there's like some form of lace outfit on top of the skirt. Um, so that was the lace special effect. Um, the other effect was the glowing tattoos and I feel, I feel like I've gotten fairly good at glowing things. Really the glowing things, um, what you typically do is whatever you want to glow, you put a color dodge layer on top of that um, and blur that color dodge layer. So in the case of uh, the kids tattoos, kids gl glowing tattoos, I basically redraw that tattoo with a blue, uh, bright saturated blue uh, color and then I blurred that layer and then set it to color dodge. Um, typically one layer will do the trick, um, but sometimes I do two or three it, with different levels of opacity, you know, just to kind of achieve this nice glowing look. And so that's how I did the glowing tattoos. The floor on the other hand is really, really tricky. Um, I knew that I wanted the reflections and early on, um, I, I basically know that, well, okay. In, in real life, when you look at reflections, um, especially on floors, they're not typically bright. Like they're kind of toned down, uh, in brightness level. And so, you know, when I did the reflection, I, I knew I had to turn down the brightness, but it had the net effect of making the floor look like it's not receiving light from the sun. So that was one of the things that I had to troubleshoot a lot. Like I had to figure out how to solve that problem. Like right now you're watching me detail the floor without the reflection levels or without the reflection layers turned on because this is what I do. I, whenever I have special effects and long illustrations like this, I put them on separate layers so I could turn them on and off depending on what I'm doing. Since I'm working on the floor and detailing the floor right now, I turn off the reflection just so that I could just concentrate on the floor. And if you look at the floor, it is like nicely balanced with the light. You look at the lower right, you see that there's the bright sun uh, coming in and shining and ca casting this shadow and it just it has a nice value range but when i put that reflection layer um and that reflection layer is set to multiply which multiply tends to darken things and i did that because i know that reflection tends to be dark right um when I turn on that reflection layer, it just kills the brightness on the lower right. See, I turned it back on right now and you can see that the blue isn't quite as bright as it is on the outside. So I had to troubleshoot that like towards the end and pretty much the way I did it is that I pretty much just have to add another color dodge layer and kind of play around with the opacity level on it because I didn't obviously want it too bright that it would wash out things, you know. Uh, so yeah, that was a hard thing to balance when I was uh, doing this illustration. Um, would I achieve a great balance? Uh, I don't really know. Uh, so far, I'm happy with what I got, you know. Um, the other thing that I was kind of had issues with the floor was that I, I felt like it got too photorealistic. Um, in my long grinds and in my long illustrations, I want it to be as fairly realistic as I can get, but I don't want to do photorealism. Like this is, I think a conscious decision that I've been going through lately where even though I'll go on long grinds, I actually have a tendency to dial down the photorealism as much because there's this whole thing where i end up in the uncanny valley and the uncanny valley just sucks <laughs> that's about the only thing i can say about the uncanny valley um basically the uncanny valley kind of makes things it, it's that state of art where everything looks too realistic that it almost looks fake <laughs> so 
I try to avoid the uncanny valley by going painterly realistic. Um, that's kind of been like the mode of operation I've had lately. And this is the reason why I smudge things now. When when people photo bash, especially in the concept art industry, when people photo bash, they have a tendency to not destroy the what they photo bash, you know? Instead of smudging things around like I do, they just straight up start detailing on top of the photos. I used to do that. I don't do that anymore. What I do is I tend to smudge things just to kind of give it a painterly look. And this is the reason why I take an extra hour or two to smudge things. It's just because I have decided that I want more of a painterly realism, kind of like the way it was with Winslow Homer, for example, you know, or Adolfi Bogro. Although Adolfi Bogro is really good with realism that he's almost photorealism too. Um, but yeah, I just don't like the Uncanny Valley. <laughs> it's just my whole point. Um, I mean, yeah, I just don't like the Uncanny Valley. And so that's the reason why the floor for me is in the Uncanny Valley right now. You know, if you look, if you take a look at the final illustration, it almost looks like it's from a photograph, you know, which kind of makes it look weird because if you look at the top half of the painting or top half of the illustration, you could tell that it's painterly, you know. Now, I personally feel like I achieved like a nice balance between that painterly feel versus that photorealism feel. So I'm going to keep things as is and not mess around with it anymore. You know, I don't know how else everyone would look at it. So yeah, I don't know. But the floor is really good looking. I mean, you know, if I take it, if I look at it by itself, it looks really, really good. But yeah, it does sit in the Uncanny Valley. So um, I have to dial it down somehow. Um, but yeah, this is something that I watch out for. So yeah, I mean, I've been doing illustrations for like a good 10 plus years now and I still get into troubles like this one right here where it's like, it looks so good, but it looks kind of fake and yeah. Anyways, that's on Candy Valley for you. So, you know, it's hard to perfect. But anyways, um, I pretty much done with detailing the floor and I kind of turned the reflection layer back on and then I'm trying to finish up the wall uh, and then after that I'm going to start detailing uh, Bridget Mendler which I'll talk some more about in the next few minutes
so basically I have started detailing Bridget Mendler at this point um you guys just saw me work on her, the skin part and I wanted to work on that um first before anything else well or actually originally I was just doing the face and I was just gonna work on the face then the hair and then work my way down but then I realized that the skin tone was kind of dark and I was like playing around with filter edits just to make the skin tone a little bit brighter or look like it's a little brighter um, and make her not look too dark and so what I decided to do was just work on all the skin tones uh, just so that I could do all the filter edit at one go um, so I did a test first. I liked the result um, and then I decided I was just gonna just draw the skin tones And so that's what I did. I drew the arms and then the baby and then as soon as I have all of that I made a selection on all the skin tones and then I kind of just did that filter edit and then as soon as I'm done with that filter edit I slowly started working my way from the top all the way down to the bottom so uh, you just saw me just finish with the hair, uh, which the hair was really, really fun. At first, I thought it was going to be uber, uber complicated, um, but it turned out to be really easy, actually. It, it was very easy. I had good references when, when I was doing the hair, so that was, like, really fun to do. Uh, her tank top, I went way too overboard with the details. Again, this is the whole over-detailing problem that I can was telling you guys about I have a bad tendency to over detail and in the case of her tank top I did way too many wrinkles um, I paused working on the tank top uh, right now because I wanted to work on the baby first so I, I knocked out all the details in the baby uh, after that and then I went back to working on the tank top and like I mentioned it was just way too over detailed that in the end I kinda had to turn things down by going back uh, over some of my details and pretty much just destroying it <laughs> is what I did because it was it was got too busy um I like the little ruffles that I drew uh, I thought I was like nicely balanced but as for the wrinkles like on the back of her shirt that was too much the skirt was like really tricky um I wasn't really sure about how it curves around her legs um, I didn't really have a good reference um, on the skirt I mean I got great references for what the skirt was gonna look like but I didn't have a great reference for a skirt of a lady sitting down the way Bridget Mendler is sitting down on this photo so that was difficult and so I had to kind of invent a lot of the details in but I was also depending on the lace to kind of cover up my mistakes like there's some mistakes that I still see on the illustration but the good thing is it's hidden by the lace so it's not quite as apparent um so yeah um so yeah basically after I finish uh rendering the shirt I slowly started um rendering the skirt yeah so after i was done with the shirt i did the skirt and then after i did the skirt i worked on the chair which in all honesty the chair <laughs> is the weakest point in the whole illustration if you pay attention to it and if you take a good look at it it's not very well rendered <laughs> I kind of took the lazy approach with the chair because I, at this point in time, I was, you know, 30 hours into the illustration and I was just like, I just want to see this finish, you know? And so, yeah, the chair, probably the weakest point, you know? So, yeah. But, yeah, it was a long grind, about three or four months worth of work after picking it up uh, sometime last year. Uh, as I mentioned, I started this illustration about 2014, 2015, worked on it for about five hours, something to that effect. I don't remember because I wasn't doing recordings then. Uh, I dropped it, picked it up last year again, did some setup last year, which I think all those blender setup was done last year. I could be wrong. It could have been this year too. I, I don't remember when I started it. But this was like my main predominant grind as well as another illustration that I'm still working on, uh, The Guardian, 
Uh, I'm still working on that one. And um, hopefully I get to wrap it up sometime this summer. Um, so yeah, I love long grinds like this because after the initial planning phases and after, you know, the first few rounds of critiques, you get to this point where you're all you're doing is just the detailing phase. And it gets boring at times doing the detailing. I mean, there's plenty of times when I was doing the detailing on this and I was falling asleep. It was like the weirdest experience. I'm um, like, I've never had that experience before um, where I'm falling asleep while drawing. But I was I was going through that with this one. Um, so, yeah, that was like an interesting experience. But you know it was it's zen uh, i think i mentioned this quite a few times once you start into once you get into this mode of detailing where you kind of know where the illustration is going to go because all the big issues have been taken care of and all you're doing is just the minor details it, it gets to be fun because then you could be at peace you could put on some music and just sing along while drawing or something you know and not have a care in the world like it's it's just fun it's the zen point of the illustration it can get tedious it can get boring but for the most part it is fun so yeah i wish i i do a lot more of these but of course you know working on illustrations for 30 50 hours all the time can get tough and that's the reason why i balance it with my speed paints and that's why you know i have quite a lot of speed paints um so yeah it's all about balance and just trying to balance all your workload and in this case i i really love these but i can't do a whole lot of it just because i have to balance it with a lot of my workloads so yeah, but this illustration is almost done and you can see I'm working on the chair and really I just went through this quick because at this point in time, like everything's pretty much set and done, you know. Um, the photo bashing really helps a lot with the details because this is the reason why I photo bash and this is the reason why a lot of industry professionals photo bash because it helps a lot with the details and it helps with photo real, photo realism uh, the concept art industry and illustration industry they're very heavily focused on, on photo realism so that's why they do photo bashing a lot uh, again be wary of image rights uh, in my case i always use stuff that i get from textures.com which they're such a great resource go go check out that site textures.com um but yeah um well, just be careful when you use photos uh, and make sure that you have all the rights usage all cleared out and whatnot. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, photos do help a lot in achieving that nice, crisp um, photo realism. But in my case, though, like I mentioned, I try to dial things down. Like, I don't want to push the photo realism too far just because the whole uncanny valley effect has become... Uh, my own personal choice so who knows maybe in the future i might change my mind on it again and i might push photorealism again i don't know but for now i'm just all about painterly realism whatever that may be uh it might be something else it might mean something else for someone else but for me it means more painterly like winslow homer or something so yeah but yeah, this illustration is almost done. Thank you guys for watching it with me. Thank you for listening to my own comments and critiques of my own piece. Um, I hope you learned a thing or two. That, uh, this is the reason why I do this. So yeah. Um, but yeah, this illustration is done. Uh, I will see you guys in the next video. Like and subscribe. Good night. Good night.